This program is made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. Friends, this is Rick Renner, and here I am with my wonderful team standing on the possible ruins of the real authentic Noah's Ark. With me is Andrew Jones, who's been a researcher here for 20 years, a SEAL who has been my guide all over Turkey for nearly 20 years, my grandson William, who's part of our team, my son Joel, who's the CEO of our ministry, Paul Renner, who is the pastor of the Moscow Good News Church, Nikita, who's in our media team, and my assistant, Maxime, and Mark Dogan in the back, who's running the drone. But we've all come here today because we're teaching a series called Fallen Angels, Giants, Monsters, and the World Before the Flood. And again, we're standing on the probable ruins of the real Noah's Ark. And the Bible tells us that when the Ark finally rested in the mountains of Ararat, God had to command Noah to make the animals leave the Ark. They didn't want to leave. And God said, order them to leave. Those animals were exiting the ark and entering a world unlike the one they knew before the flood. This teaching today is going to be amazing. So stay with me all the way to the end. Right now, I'm seated on a mountain called Mount Judy. It's one of the mountains in the Ararat Range. And this was identified as the place where the ark actually rested when it came to rest in the mountains of Ararat. That's what the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 8, verse 4. But look behind me. You'll see behind me the cloud-covered peak of Mount Ararat itself, and next to it, Lower Ararat. And that is a flood valley below that's been completely shaped by water. What's really interesting is as the ark sailed into this region, it sailed up that area. And today, if you go down into the flood valley below, you can find drogue stones, which were used by the ark. I'm talking about huge stones, which were used to balance the ark during the flood so that it would not capsize. And as Noah sailed up this way in his huge ship, they began to cut those drogue stones. And today, if you follow the stones, you can follow the path of the ark as then it turned and it sailed right up into this region where it seems that it rested right here on the top of Mount Judy, which is in the Ararat mountain range. And once they were here, they began to descend into the valley below. This is actually a floodplain, and this is a mudslide, an earth slide. The ark originally sat here, but eventually moved down the mountain to where it sets today. But when we come to Genesis chapter 8, verse 14, the Bible says, and in the second month on the seventh day, seventh and twentieth day of the month was the earth dried. And God spake unto Noah, saying, verse 16, Go forth of the ark thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee, and bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee. And from this place they exited the ark and began to make their way down into a brand new world. It's also interesting that this place is called Mishar today. It's from the old word Misha, which can be found in Genesis chapter 10, verse 30, which states that Noah built the first city after the flood in this place, and it may have been located just below the cliff to my side. There are ruins there which are very, very old, and some people believe that they date to the time of Noah when he and his sons built the very first civilization, the first city after the flood. But this really is Misha, which is identified in the Bible, which today means Doomsday Mountain. Isn't that amazing? The top of this peak is called the Place of the Landing, but this is called Doomsday Mountain. It is an echo in people's memory of what once occurred in this place. But today, we're going to begin to study about what happened the day that Noah and his family and all the animals exited the ark. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Welcome to the program. My name is Rick Renner, and I've been waiting for you. I'm so glad we're back. And today we're going to continue our series, which is called Fallen Angels, Giants, Monsters, and the World Before the Flood. It's 15 parts. And as you saw 
in the introduction to today's program. Today, I'm going to talk to you about when Noah and his family and all the animals began to exit the ark. And today, the introduction was me standing on the top of Mount Judy in the very place where the ark first rested after the flood. By the way, Judy means the place of the landing. It's really where it took place. Eventually, over thousands of years, the ark slid down the side of the mountain because the whole side of that mountain is covered with mud. And today it's located about 1,200 feet lower. But today we're going to talk about what happened when Noah and his family and the animals exited the ark. But I want you to order the whole series, which is Fallen Angels, Giants, Monsters, and the World Before the Flood. It's 15 parts, and it comes with a study guide that you are simply going to love because it is so enormous and so packed with information. And of course, I think it's important for you to have the study guide so you can read all the information while you're seeing or hearing the whole series. And we're also offering you right now a book by Dr. Dennis Lindsay. Have you ordered yours yet? If not, you need to order yours today. The name of the book is Giants, Fallen Angels, and the Return of the... Nephilim. And the subtitle says, Ancient Secrets to Prepare You for the Coming Days. We're living in the end of the age, and we need to know what Jesus forecast about the times that we're living in. So please order yours today. And you can order all these things by going online or by giving us a call right now. And please let us know how to pray for you. Just call that number or send us an email, and the moment we hear from you, we're going to really pray with you. You're going to know you've really been prayed for, and Jesus is going to do something marvelous. But hey, reach for your Bible. We always use the Bible in this program, and today we're going to return to the book of Genesis, but today we're going to begin in chapter 8, verse 4. And when you come to Genesis chapter 8, verse 4, the Bible says, And the ark rested in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. But I want to remind you today of what I shared with you last week about the Ararat mountain range. Ararat is not a single mountain. That's a rather new development. Mount Ararat is a stratovolcano which has erupted and erupted and erupted. And at the time of the flood, it probably was not even a large mountain. Ararat is a mountain range. And the Bible here says that the ark rested upon the mountains of Ararat, and the entire region later came to be known as the Uratu Kingdom. And it's very interesting that that is where scholars believe the Garden of Eden was first established, which means that God took Noah back to the place where man first started and said, hey, let's get a fresh start. And not only that, God spoke exactly the same identical words to Noah in the same place that he spoke to Adam. He said, be fruitful, multiply and replenish the earth. Only God would do something so amazing. But this mountain range was also connected to one particular mountain called Judy, an ancient Sources tell us that when the ark landed, it landed on the mountain of Judy in the mountains of Ararat. So it's part of the mountain range of Ararat, but this particular mountain is called Judy. And the name Judy means the place of the landing. It was named by early writers who wanted to identify this as the place where the ark landed. It's on a slope, which is called Mishur. That's the modern name. The ancient name is Misha, and that name is in the Bible. You can find it in Genesis chapter 10, verse 30, where we find the first city after the flood was built on the slopes of Misha. And by the way, today, if you go there, and if you scale your way up to the cliffs above this region, on the slopes of Misha, you can still see ruins of an ancient settlement, probably the first city built after the flood by Noah and his sons. I think that is absolutely amazing. And the Bible even tells us in Genesis chapter 10, verse 21, that Noah's son was the forefather of all the sons of Eber. And verse 30 says, they were said to dwell toward Sefer, a mountain in the east, having come from Misha. My friends, where 
The ruins of the ark are located today perfectly fits the descriptions which are given to us in the Bible. But as I've told you, originally it landed at the top of Mount Judy, slid down the side of Misha, and today it is 1,200 feet lower, but there is in that place a huge ship-shaped formation that is 515 feet long. It is the shape of an ancient classical ship. Well, ships in the ancient world were referred to with three measurements, and I want to give these to you again. First, there was the length, which is a hard number, and it's an actual measurement of length. Second, there is always the average width of the ship, and the reason they give the width of the ship is because the rest of the ship had a different width, but they usually the measurements give us the very middle of the width of the ship. And finally, there is the third measurement, which is the height of the ship, which includes the hull and the superstructure. And the dimensions of the ark shape on the slopes of Judy and Misha exactly fit the measurements given in the Bible. And let me tell you something else. Because of ground penetrating radar and because of ERT scans that have been done, many, 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 many of them, we actually have evidence that you can see the entire hull of the ship. And when you look at these scans, it is amazing because it's very evident you really are looking at the hull of a giant ship. And geologists have affirmed that it has no connection to the geology. It's just sitting there in the middle of that mud flow. My friends, it really is a 515 foot ship in the lower mountains of Ararat. Now, some people have alleged that the ark landed on the very peak of Mount Ararat, but the Bible doesn't say that. It says it landed in the mountains of Ararat. It's nearly impossible that it could have landed on the peak of Mount Ararat, first of all, because Ararat probably was not what it is today at that time. It was much smaller. Secondly, it is a stratovolcano, which is explosive. And when it explodes, it loses the whole top of the mountain. Huge amounts of, of lava come out. In fact, today, if you look at Mount Ararat and the surrounding regions, it's covered by enormous amounts of lava. And if the ark had landed on the peak of what today is called Mount Ararat, it would have been blown to bits or it would have been covered with lava. And not only that, to get there today, it takes serious, serious climbing equipment and sometimes even the use of oxygen. Well, if Noah had landed there high, 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 it would have been nearly impossible for him and the animals to survive or to scale down the side of the mountain. And even more than that, I've already covered for you that there were many, many ancient writers who affirmed they went to the ark and examined it. They could have never gone to the peak of Mount Ararat without the serious equipment that is used today and probably the use of oxygen. My friends, they didn't go there. They went to Mount Judy. In fact, historical writers tell us that very, very clearly. The Bible says in Genesis 8, 4, that the ark landed in the mountains of Ararat. That is amazing. But in Genesis 6, 16, God instructed Noah to build the ark 300 cubits in length, which would make the ark approximately 515 feet in length. And the ship in the lower mountains of Ararat today is exactly 515 feet in length. In Genesis 6, 16, God instructed Noah to build the ark 50 cubits in width, which would make the ark approximately 85 feet wide, and the ship in the lower mountains of Ararat today are approximately 85 feet wide. In Genesis 6, 16, God instructed Noah to build the ark 30 cubits high, which would make the ark approximately 50 feet high, and the ship in the lower mountains of Ararat today are 50 feet high. And in Genesis chapter 6, verse 14, God instructed Noah to build many rooms inside the ark, and scans show they prove that in that structure on the slopes of Judy and Misha, it has many, many rooms. And not only that, in Genesis 6, 16, God instructed Noah to make the ark with three stories and scans show the ship in the lower mountains of Ararat has three stories. 
My friends, the Bible is absolutely true. But when you come to Genesis chapter 8, verse 5, it continues to say, And the waters decreased continually until the 10th month. And in the 10th month, on the first day of the month, were the tops of the mountains seen. Verse 13. And it came to pass in the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked. And behold, the face of the earth was dry. It was dry, but it was not dry enough to walk upon yet. So Noah waited. And then you come to Genesis chapter 8, verse 14, which says, and in the second month on the seventh and 20th day of the month was the earth dried, which means Noah and his finally could finally leave the ark. And they had been on the ark for nearly 365 days. Wow. A whole year on that ark. Then you come to Genesis 8, 15. And God spake unto Noah, saying, verse 16, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee. I want to point something very important out to you. God told them exactly when to enter the ark, and they did not go into the ark until God said, Right now, go on board. Now we find in this verse, they did not exit the ark until God said, go forth. God explicitly told them when to enter. God explicitly told them when to exit. And Noah was careful not to move without divine directions. And my friends, that's a good lesson for all of us to learn. Many times we get in trouble because we act too fast. We need to listen to the Lord when he says go. We need to listen to the Lord when he says stay. And God was very clear to instruct Noah when to enter and when to exit the ark. And when you come to Genesis chapter 8, verse 17, it continues to say, Go forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of all flesh both of fowl and of cattle and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. But notice at the very beginning of Genesis chapter 8, verse 17, it says, go forth. And the Hebrew tense is very, very strong. It means bring them out even by force if necessary, which means the animals were a little leery to leave the ark. Even the animals had been on the ship for a year and they knew they were entering a different world and Noah had to force them out of the ark to re-enter the world. And I was thinking about this this morning as I was getting ready when my dog did not want to go out the door of the house. Our dog looks at us like, why do you human beings stay inside? Why do I have to go out? I had to force the dog out of the house. Well, think about these animals. They'd been on that ark for a year. They had been through a lot in a year. Now the ark door opens. Noah looks out. It's a completely different world from what they knew before. Even the animals are a little leery about leaving the ark. And here we find that God literally says, bring them out by force if necessary. Make the animals leave the ark. Genesis 8, 18, and Noah went forth and his sons and his wife and his son's wives with him. Verse 19, every beast, every creeping thing, every fowl and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after their kinds went forth out of the ark. Chapter 8, verse 20, and Noah built it an ark unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Well, let me tell you something. Very near to the landing site at the very top of Mount Judy, there is a massive, massive, massive stone, which really is an ancient altar. And the local people who live there today who are Kurdish say that from the most ancient times, that stone was identified as the place where Noah offered this sacrifice. And in fact, if you look at that massive stone, you can see exactly where the sacrifice would have been made. There is a blood channel that has been cut with human instrumentation for thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago that goes all the way across the top of the rock where the blood could flow and then go off the side of the rock. That is most likely the place where this event took place and the place where God gave Noah the rainbow and he looked up 
and he saw the bow which God had set in the sky. My friend, it is amazing that all of these things really are there. But in this verse, it says, Noah builded an altar unto the Lord. And the word Lord in Hebrew is Hashem, which means mercy. You could translate it, and Noah built an altar unto mercy. God had been merciful, and Noah knew that. Thus, he builded an altar. That's what we read in verse 20. And this was Noah's first act after leaving the ark. He knew he needed to bring God a sacrifice, and it was his way of giving thanks to God for bringing them through the deluge. And it would have been inappropriate if he had not stopped to offer a sacrifice and to give thanksgiving. And in the same way, when God does something marvelous in our lives, we need to pause and give God thanks and offer a sacrifice to him. But then you come to Genesis chapter 8, verse 21, and the Bible continues to say, And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. But Noah's sacrifice pleased God. And in Genesis chapter 9, verse 1, God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, which are the very same words God said to, Noah, to Adam, probably in the very same place. This was the Uratu kingdom, which is also where the Garden of Eden was located. So now God brings man back to the very same place where it all began, gives him a fresh start, gives him the very same words, the very same charge, and a supernatural ability was released in them to quickly multiply. Wow. Then we go on, and the Bible says in chapter 8, verse 9, and God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, verse 9, And I, behold, I will establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you, verse 10, and with every living creature that is with you of the fowls of, and of the cattle and of every beast of the earth with you from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth, verse 11. And I will establish my covenant with you, neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, neither shall any more be a flood to destroy the earth. By the way, God did not say he wouldn't bring destruction. He just said he wouldn't do it with a flood. And then when you get to verse 9, 13, the Bible says, I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and thee, verse 14, and it shall come to pass. When I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud, verse 15, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh, verse 16, and the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth, verse 17, and God said unto Noah, this is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. And that big stone on Mount Judy is most likely the place where Noah offered this sacrifice and where he first saw the bow appear in the heavens. I think all of this is remarkable, but hey, we've got so much more to cover. So we're going to start here when we come back tomorrow. But I'll be back in just a moment, and I am going to pray for you. Finally, Rick Renner has unlocked the mystery surrounding the sons of God and the giants that appeared in the earth before the flood during the days of Noah. To film this riveting series, Fallen Angels, Giants, Monsters, and the World Before the Flood, Rick and his team traveled to eastern Turkey to the ruins of Noah's Ark. In this series, Rick dives deep into the scriptures to give you answers about who are the sons of God in Genesis 6, 1 and 2? What does the promise of 120 years really mean? Where is the real location of Noah's Ark today? Rick says, 
This is the series I've wanted to teach for decades. With the research we conducted at the real Noah's Ark, along with amazing historical records, I believe this long-awaited series will answer a multitude of questions for people who have wondered about the strange events that occurred before the flood and what Jesus said about them being repeated at the end of the age. This 15-part series is available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $24. In addition, we're offering Dennis Lindsay's astounding book, Giants, Fallen Angels, and the return of the Nephilim. This book will amaze you and open your mind to mysteries hidden in the Bible that have great impact on our world today. This book can be yours for $20. Don't delay. Order this bundle of the 15-part series, Fallen Angels, Giants, Monsters, and the World Before the Flood, and the book, Giants, Fallen Angels, and the Return of the Nephilim. Call the number on your screen or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. Hey friends, this is Rick Renner and I'm standing outside the new TV studio in Moscow. Praise God, most of the interior is already finished. They're still working on Denise's studio, so pray for us as we continue, it's gonna be nice. And if you see the big bulldozer behind me, that's because they're getting ready to do the parking lot. You know, winter comes pretty early in our part of the world, so we need to really seize the moment and get this parking done before the cold weather sets in. But hey, we're making progress and praise God, the studio is paid for. This is all paid for. And I wanna say thank you for being the most amazing partners and helping us with this. And now the project in front of us is to pay off the Tulsa facility. We want to retire the debt on the big office complex in Tulsa because when that's paid off, suddenly all those finances are gonna be released for us to go on more TV and minister to people all over the world. My friends, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 10, 21, that the lips of the righteous feed many. I know that's my assignment, to feed as many people the Word of God as possible, and I'm doing it with you. Wow, thank you for being a partner. You're part of the giving team that's helping us make amazing progress. And if you're not a part of the giving team yet, please pray about joining us to retire the debt on the Tulsa building. It's not about buildings. It's just about having the space we need so that we can effectively minister to people. We want to retire that debt so we can take the Word of God to more parts of the world where people are crying out for teaching they can trust. And I want to say thank you for everything you do. My friend, thank you for being with me today. We've covered a lot of material and I pray this has been a blessing to you. But I want you to have the whole series, which is called Fallen Angels, Giants, Monsters, and the World Before the Flood. It's 15 parts, and believe me, it is jam-packed. And it comes with a wonderful study guide. And we're also offering you Dr. Dennis Lindsay's book, which is called Giants, Fallen Angels, and the Return of the Nephilim. You can order all these things by going online, or you can just call us right now. And if you reach out to us by phone or by email, please let us know how to pray for you. And I want to pray for you right now. Just put your hand on your heart. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus that you have made a covenant with us and you remember your covenant. I thank you that you've set a rainbow over our lives, a promise that you are with us to the end. I thank you that you've done this for me. You've done it for my friend and with all of your sons and your daughters. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll see you tomorrow. But please never forget Ecclesiastes 8.4. It says, where the word of a king is, there is power.